concerning the thunderstorms of Yucatan. In Yucatan, the Maya sonneteers of the Caribbean amphitheater, in spite of Hawk and Falcon, Green, Toucan, and Jay, still to the light bird made their plea, as if raspberry tanagers in palms high up in orange air were barbarous. But Crispin was too destitute to find in any commonplace the sought-for aid. He was a man made vivid by the sea, a man come out of luminous traversing, much trumpeted, much desperately clear, fresh from discoveries of tidal skies, to whom oracular rockings gave no rest. Into a savage color he went on. How greatly had he grown in his demeanor, this auditor of insects, he that saw the stride of vanishing autumn in a park by way of decorous melancholy, he that wrote his couplet yearly to the sprig, a dissertation of proud delight stopping on voyage in a land of stakes, found his vicissitudes had much enlarged his apprehension, made him intricate in moody rucks and difficult and strange in all desires, his destitution's mark. He was in this, as other free men are, sonorous nutshells, rattling inward, his violence was for aggrandizement and not for stupor, such as music makes for sleepers halfway waking. He perceived that coolness for his heat came suddenly, and only in the fables that he scrawled with his own quill in its indigenous dew of an aesthetic, tough, diverse, untamed, incredible to prudes the mint of dirt. Green barbarism turning paradigm, Crispin foresaw a curious promenade of nobler, sensed, and elemental fate. And elemental potencies and pangs, and beautiful bareness as yet unseen, making the most of savagery of palms of moonlight on the thick, cadaverous bloom that yuccas breed and of the panthers tread. The fabulous and its intrinsic verse came like two spirits parleying adorned in radiance from the Atlantic coin. For Crispin and his quill to catechize, but they came parlaying of such an earth so thick with sides and jagged lops of green, so intertwined with serpent kind, encoiled among the purple tufts, the scarlet crown, scented the jungle in their refuges. So streaked with yellow, blue, and green, and red in beak and bud and fruity garbit skins, that earth was like a jostling festival of seeds grown fat, too juicily opulent, expanding in the gold's maternal warmth. So much that the affectionate emigrant found a new reality in parrot squawks, yet left that trifle past. Now, as this odd discoverer walked through the harbor streets, inspecting the cabildo, the facade of the cathedral, making notes, he heard a rumbling west of Mexico. It seemed approaching like a gasconade of drums. The white cabildo darkened the facade. As sullen as the sky was swallowed up in swift successive shadows dolefully, the rumbling broadened as it fell, the wind tempestuous, clarion with heavy cry came bluntly thundering, more terrible than the revenge of music on bassoons. Gesticulating lightning mystical made pallid flitter Crispin here took flight. An annotator has his scruples too. He knelt in the cathedral with the rest, the connoisseur of elemental fate, aware of exquisite thought. The storm was one of many proclamations of the kind, proclaiming something harsher than he learned from hearing signboards whimper in cold nights of seeing the midsummer artifice of heat upon his pain. This was the span of force, the quintessential fact, the note of Vulcan, that of valet seeks to own the thing that makes him envious in phrase, 
And while the torrent on the roof still droned, he felt the Andean breath. His mind was free, and more than free, elate, intent, profound, and studious of a self-possessing him that was not in him in the crusty town. From which he sailed beyond him westward lay the mountainous ridges purple balustrades in which the thunder lapsing in its clasp let down gigantic quavers of his voice for Crispin to vociferate again. <laughs> <laughs>